success story, so to speak, of reason uh, when it comes to the global economic discourse is recognizing the fact that countries such as Bangladesh and Mexico, they have climbed back from position of uh, economic chaos as it was in the 60s and 70s to a position of rapid economic growth. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, they are being looked at as the future engines of economic growth for not just themselves, but the entire world. How did Mexico do this? How did Mexico emerge from a country which was looked down upon with a very negative light when it comes to, say, the economic world, when it comes to added emissions, tier additions, to now someone to be even emulated? Well, I would say, that, you know, let me, let me try to, to put this in context. I think that uh, we've had uh, some serious pitfalls in, uh, in our economic development, certainly, in the, we had it in the 70s, also in the 80s, and then again at the beginning of the 90s, where we had economic crises that were very, very significant, uh, and which, were, which affected, uh, to a large extent, Mexico or originated in Mexico for different reasons. And of course, you know, we've also been part of global upheavals such as the 2008 uh, economic crisis. Having said that, I think that uh, Mexico, you know, kind of set, you know, sets it itself up to uh, uh, um, to to a road of economic prosperity and development. I think, you know, from the early 90s, actually, just at the same time when we had this, uh, this uh, economic downturn that was very serious in 94, 95, and that was the signing of the North American Free Trade Agreement. It was the recognition that, you know, we have a, a very important economic relationship with our neighbors to the north, the United States and Canada, and uh, sort of, you know, consolidated this agreement, which in its day was, of course, was, uh, you know, uh, 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 a landmark event in, uh, in, in many ways. And the agreement was renegotiated, well not renegotiated, but it was updated uh, and some aspects were renegotiated in the last year and it was finally, it was finalized last summer and signed again and ratified by the, by the three legislative bodies of the three countries last uh, June, July. Uh, so this, and what, what this has done is that this, first of all, has created <coughs> what was, because now, of course, there's the other, the, the, there's a Pacific Agreement uh, on free trade, but this was you know, the largest economic zone in the world. That was one, one important aspect. The second one is that it was, uh, it was a success story. There was uh, tremendous growth. The external sector of Mexico's economy became a powerful engine of growth for Mexico, <coughs> excuse me, but also, as you say, for other countries. And it also has made Mexico, of course, a very attractive place for foreign investors because, uh, uh, you, know, you know, for example, like some of the Indian uh, companies that have set up investments in Mexico, they are benefiting, of course, of this free trade area that includes uh, the largest market in the world mm -hmm. still, which is the United States, and of course uh, Canada. <coughs> and Mexico also, which has a very dynamic uh, internal market. So all of this is very, is, uh, I think, you know, has made a, a, a significant difference. And, uh, and also Mexico, not only in, the, in North America, you know, we have signed uh, a large number of free trade agreements which encompass something like 40 some countries around the world. And all in all, in the, the, the reach that we have through our free trade agreements, is almost uh, equivalent to the population of India itself. So almost a billion, 300 million people are included if you add up all of the countries with which Mexico has a free trade agreement. So the attractiveness of, of Mexico for uh, seen from outside is that this is a country that provides a platform of growth that is very very important and continues to be that way and of course now you know we also have engaged in other mechanisms which are happening important for example the Pacific Alliance with Colombia with Peru and Chile uh, you know we, we've, uh, we've become you know if you take the four countries together we're the eighth economy of the world uh, so that's, a, that's again, that's a very, very significant uh, uh, 
you know, way of, way of looking at things. So all of this, of course, has creating a, you know, a, a, a dynamic situation that makes Mexico very attractive and that hopefully will keep Mexico growing uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. So you alluded to the uh, 1990s peso of crisis. Yes. And we're living in a time of economic crisis as we speak right now as well. Of a, just, of a very different nature. Of a very different nature, yes. But the memories of 2008 are still pertinent when it comes to most countries. Right. And we are seeing a, what some people would call a populist backlash across many large economies, mm -hmm. particularly developed ones. In this regard, many countries, including the United States, have tried to renegotiate free trade agreements, and some countries are even showing signs of hostility to it. In this regard, when it comes to international financial governance, countries such as India and Mexico, we've been trying hard and bargaining hard to keep this open order going, to make sure that the fruits of globalization reach as big a population as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In this regard, how is Mexico stepping up when it comes to diplomatic efforts uh, for this international financial governance? How do we deal with it? Well, you know, we, we certainly, I mean, we have been uh, uh, working very hard to, uh, to guarantee economic stability uh, across the board. And this is something that, uh, that we're very keen on because, of course, we know that how it can affect us very severely, you know, if it does. And, uh, and we're working, you know, through, you know through, through different channels and different institutions. Uh, which include, of course, you know, mechanisms like the OECD, for example, that was presided by, or is still presided by the Mexican, uh, until recently, you know, an Australian has, uh, is going to be the successor of, of, of Mr. Gurria. Uh, but we have also been working with the other multilateral financial institutions to guarantee uh, financial stability around, around the world. Uh, again, this is one of those issues that requires a common effort, a, a common purpose of how to approach uh, th these issues, and hopefully we'll be able to avoid uh, crises, world, you know, global crises like the ones we had in 2008. I think that you know one of the important uh, lessons of the, or, or outcomes of this crisis actually is that. Uh, I think in many cases we have been intelligent enough to learn from them and therefore to create buffers in order to avoid what has happened before. Now this is no guarantee of you know, something unexpected happening again because of course you know, this is a, a rapidly evolving situation and in the financial world, uh, you know, the financial world of, of, of the early 90s is very different from the one today. So the recipes or the, the, the mindsets that we had in those days as to how to deal with these issues are not necessarily the ones that will work today. But we need to keep you know, evolving and, as I said, working together, keep open channels of dialogue. And, uh, and we are convinced that, uh, uh, I think so certainly in Mexico, because our, our example has, has been a proof that having an open economy and an economy that reaches out uh, to, to the rest of the world is beneficial to, uh, well, certainly to us, and I th we think that it could be beneficial to other countries.